so Mustafa, just in terms of like how we're doing what we do and, and what the what the basic product is, right? The entry level version of this product. Yeah, exactly. The actual yeah, product. So the the what entry is. level version of this product is that we will help you measure your carbon emissions. We'll help you track those emissions and how they change over time. And we'll help you report those emissions out. And reporting out could mean reporting to a number of different stakeholders. It could be to your banks. It could be to CDP and and NGOs and regulators, uh, and it could be to your consumers and your end customers, for instance. So you know, there's a range of, of different stuff that we can do on top of that. And, and frankly, the bigger the company, usually the more complex it gets. And certain industries are inherently complex. If you think about, for instance, the automotive industry, so many different parts, very finely tuned processes, right? There's an element of complexity there. But one of the companies we're speaking with, for instance, is a large distributor of industrial equipment. And for them, there's this massive network optimization element as well. And they would normally do that anyway as part of their uh, resource saving and, and cost saving. But the way that emissions factors into that can often be very complex as well. So there's all kinds of complexity that we might build on top of the base product. We try to keep the base product very simple, very easy to understand, very easy to use. Um, and then and then add on complexity based on customer needs. So in, in some companies, this might be something very simple. You never go beyond the base product. You just need to measure and track and report out your carbon numbers. And that's frankly it. And, and this might be something that is the, the low tens of thousands of dollars of spend for you per year. This could also become something hugely complicated. And, and some of the companies that we're speaking with, if you think about the sustainability function in the business, uh, they employ hundreds of people there. One company we spoke with em employs 40 people on the strategy side of sustainability, 80 people on the energy efficiency side, and 100 people out in the field doing sustainable sourcing. And so for those sorts of organizations, those kinds of numbers of people in that function have built up as a result of an attempt to solve complexity. And that indicates that there's a lot of problems. There are a lot of complicated problems, whether it's regarding data or just the inherent functions and processes of the business or the raw materials, because they're in incorporating so many different ingredients going in uh, that we, we feel that that's opportunity for us, frankly, to make their lives simpler, easier, make them more efficient and ultimately free up bandwidth and space for them to focus on the challenges that are not only probably more important ultimately than data gathering and data cleaning and, and, and basic analysis, but also frankly, more interesting. And we try and think of our customers as individuals and as people, right? These, these users are, are, are people who want to enjoy what they do when they come to work. And in almost all cases, you go into work in sustainability because you're passionate about it much like we are. And if you find that now you have to sit in front of an Excel spreadsheet and feed things into you know, Microsoft BI, like it's not what you signed up for. And so what we're trying to do is just make all of that simple, mm. easy, and give everyone the joy that you know a salesperson might have felt when they when they open up their first CRM tool and it's slick and it's easy and everything's now automated, uh, and there are all kinds of cool and funky integrations that help them just do so much more, right? Like that's the that's the feeling that we want the user to have when they open up our product for the first time. Okay. On 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 that specific now. Okay, you you mentioned um, your customers are the companies who are value 1 billion plus, okay? Um, uh, Mr. The correction, rev, revenue it's, it's, 1 it's, billion plus, uh, which is usually a much, okay. much larger number in terms of value. Much larger even, okay, much larger, not, not just worth, okay, revenue 1 billion plus, okay. So, you know, the, the, these are massive, massive corporations we're talking about. And some of the listeners probably have not actually been involved in such an environment before. I mean, Silicon Roundabout, it's more of a startup community rather than, you know, a corporate community, if you like. Uh, so this is part of what we would call what's known these days as ESG, correct? You guys, I mean, I mean, I mean even on your profile, it says that you help companies work on their ESG profiles, which is what you said you do, you help companies measure, track, and uh, report their carbon emission numbers. On that specific note, we're going to tell our listeners a bit more about ESG. What is that? Before we start digging in into the carbon emission, um, emission numbers and so yeah. on. Yeah, ESG is probably one of the least efficient acronyms in the world, right? It, it stands for Environment, Social, and Governance. 
And it's almost like a legacy term. And I'll tell you why we're using it nevertheless, right? But it's basically a legacy term that came up from an era where these topics were compliance oriented. They were something that your investors or your regulators wanted to feel that you had covered in some way. It's a tick box exercise. And you would say, look, we have an environmental policy, which is we try and take care of any toxic waste that we might otherwise be chucking into the river. Uh, we have a social policy, which means that we try to make ensure, we try to ensure that our workers are overall uh, somewhat happy, uh, stay with us for a reasonable amount of time and, and, and kind of, you know, we, we, we're not uh, factoring in any inherent biases into our recruitment policy and governance, which means we have a more or less meritocratic process of how we look at progression. And over time, naturally all of this changed. And, and what we saw was that a lot of these topics were being treated very differently by forward thinking corporations. And if you look at you know, a lot of the stuff that's coming out of tech, for instance, with, with Google putting up their organograms, you know, on their on their websites, being made very transparent, uh, many other companies from different walks of, of, of life or different industries, all trying to really push the needle on how they think about talent, uh, right, whether that's social or, or, or governance related, how they think about benefits, incentivization, uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, environment, of course, right, whether it's uh, sensitivity to climate change, emissions, water, uh, many different factors. And so the the term has in a way lost its relevance by trying to be too catch-all. The re today it's probably used much more by investors in businesses than by the management so of it... businesses. The, the businesses themselves typically think now in terms of sustainability rather than ESG. Sorry, it's, it's being used by who by, sorry, I think I lost you there for a second. Uh, no worries. I was just saying that the term ESG is now typically only really being used by investors for the most part and not even often not even the most forward leaning investors. The more forward leaning investors have already begun to split that term out into different pieces. The reason that we still talk about ESG on our side is because, you know, we brand ourselves as a sustainability tech business. ESG is the broad remit of everything we address, and it's probably the, the term that captures the widest audience in the market that we're targeting. But in terms of the, the, the product that we're building, uh, I kind of think of it as a platform that covers a broad range of potential metrics. So if you're a chief sustainability officer, you're looking at emissions, but you might also be looking at a range of other environment factors. Uh, you might ultimately also be responsible for diversity and inclusion. You might also be responsible for ensuring uh, community relations are working well. Like if you're a mining company, community relations is your license to operate. Uh, being able to work not work well with the, the, the areas and the people uh, that are around your mining sites is critical. And so the ability to play across that, that whole set of metrics and factors for us is important as we think about building a platform. But the vertical in which we build depth is really around carbon and carbon emissions or greenhouse gases. Uh, that's the real area where we want to focus our product, uh, certainly for the first, first year or, or two even. Over time, we will most likely integrate other people's products, having the, the customer base, which is the chief sustainability officers and their functions. We might well say, look, you also care about diversity. There's this great product that we found. We can integrate it nicely with our system via an API and give you the same sort of visibility on a tool that you recognize and are familiar with. And we might do that with climate risk. We might do that with uh, community affairs. We might do that with a number of different tools. Um, and you know, if we see a gap there that actually there are no tools that meet the standards we're looking for, we might over time develop our own. But having that platform uh, interface that allows our, us to cover in many ways the widest territory potentially for our specific customers and users, which are the chief sustainability officers and the sustainability function that they lead, that is strategically important for us. You were saying how you could integrate your product into uh, other, other customers into your product as well. Okay, so, so for us, it's, it's quite important to be able to serve the full need or as much of the full need of the chief sustainability officer and the sustainability function over time. That doesn't mean we need to cover the full space right now. It just means that we need to build a platform functionality where we can go very deep on carbon right now, very deep on greenhouse gases right now, but over time integrate in tools that might help solve other sustainability challenges. 
and that will be environment, but it may ultimately also be social, community affairs, various other factors that are also important. Uh, typically, we would want to not build those tools ourselves. We'd want to find something that is best in class for what it offers to do, an amazing community engagement uh, tool, an amazing diversity tool, an amazing inclusion tool, talent retention tools, potentially even for some organizations, and integrate those via APIs and just give visibility and a nice, smooth user experience for our customers. Um, and where there's a gap where actually we can't find tools that meet our standards, we might ultimately develop something in-house. But just having that platform functionality that covers you know, or promises to cover the full swathe of the customer's needs over time is strategically important for us. Um, here's a question. Um, would you guys say that your product, your organization, I mean, you say you're trying to save the world, which is fantastic. Would you say it's more of a luxury product, really, rather than an essential one? For every one of our customers, it is not seen as a luxury product. It is seen as essential. And if it were not seen as essential, they wouldn't be interested in it. And, and that kind of is, is, is pretty blunt, right? But these are not, at a certain size, right? A company like Unilever and a company like Shell, for instance, these are now mega, you know, some of the largest companies in the world, right? And, and there are larger ones than that. But for these sorts of guys, they can afford to fire off, you know, five or six darts at luxury ideas. And you could even make a case for saying none of the ideas that they're exploring are actually luxury ideas. They're all strategically relevant and important, um, but they have that kind of bandwidth and capacity that they can play multiple things and have people deployed against multiple problems that may or may not turn out to be real problems. For the customer base that we're targeting, you know, we're thinking very much the companies that are one or two billion revenue up to maybe eight, nine, 10 billion or so. These guys tend to be very, very focused on, on the immediate needs of business, just you know, culturally. And, and often they've kind of grown from smaller businesses. In many cases, they're still owner operated, uh, very sensitive industries in many ways, and often suppliers to the companies like Unilever and Coke and, and, and others. And so for these guys, the resource internally is too scarce for them to do these kinds of things. Uh, such as our product or building a sustainability function or whatever, unless it is actually critical. And I have, you know, actually not even one or two, or, but multiple examples of businesses that would not have been speaking to us two years ago or three years ago, or even in some cases, eight months ago or six but months ago. But what makes it, that's the thing. This is the question, really. What makes it essential? I mean, look, um, yes, we know. Global warming is a, is a real thing. I mean, yeah, they, you, you, you get global warming uh, warming deniers, really. But uh, we, we know, scientists do, do verify, it is a real thing. We are struggling with it. We've already discussed the floods, uh, you know, which you, you know, you, 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 you participated in helping people who were affected by back in Pakistan. Um, but, um, you know, why is your product essential i mean yeah like you said companies do have their sustainability um their sustainability functions in the house their chief sustainability officer for example if they have such a function but why is it really necessary for them to have such a product is it because there are those who can argue that this could all just be a PR stunt, really, by, by, by organization, very much like CSR was uh, once upon a time. I mean, when CSR was, even when I was back in university, it was the next thing. CSR, CSR, you know, we all have responsibility. Every organization is not, it, it's supposed to be purpose-led these days. It's not about profitability. But it, it, it became to be more of a PR thing. And I mean, the, the, the biggest, for example, or not the biggest, but a big evidence of companies not really taking this seriously would be VW with their uh, emissions scandal, um, which was, you know, it, it kind of rocketed the whole world uh, when it started. So what, why is this essential? Why should companies take this seriously? And why is your product in therefore essential? Mustafa, it's a great question. And in a way, you actually answered it, right, with the VW example. The reason they care is cash. 
the amount of, of cash, frankly, that VW lost through that uh, particular incident is, is staggering. The amount of brand equity lost, the PR damage, uh, you know, all kinds of real quantifiable impacts that hit the bottom line. And for all of our customers, that is even more immediate now. So we're talking about pressure from banks, but I'm not saying uh, pressure is not an email. Pressure is a slightly lower financing cost for a more sustainable customer and a slightly higher financing cost for a less sustainable customer. Banks are actively looking at dropping uh, clients who are heavily coal based. Uh, that's, that's kind of almost like a foregone conclusion. And they're now looking at phasing down uh, clients that are heavily oil and gas based. And in the same way, they're looking to phase up and incentivize clients that have cleaner businesses. And, and that's just a cash impact that very quickly adds up and hits the bottom line. Uh, the other thing that our customers have noticed over the years is that uh, better environmental sustainability is cheaper on your cost of materials and the resources that you're using. Think about using less material in a glass bottle, right? Think about using more recycled material in an aluminum can. Think about using less energy in getting a product from uh, place A to place B. These are all very clear numbers where the evidence is now hard to dispute. And there are many fantastic examples. Uh, you know, one, one that I like, which is nice because it's not a huge business, but it's a well-known one, is, is Lush Cosmetics. And if you've ever seen, you know, walk by a Lush store, as, as you know, the products are all kind of laid there and they're open and you can go in and you can feel them and smell them. And it's a great experience. Absolutely, and it's what yeah. makes Lush Cosmetics, it's what makes Lush Cosmetics unique, right? Mm. And actually, if you read what the owner has put out in his interviews, that did not come from an aesthetic decision. It came from a cost decision because at some point early in their life cycle, they realized that the packaging is like two thirds of the cost for their products. And if they remove the packaging, they're just saving a ton of money. And yes, it actually makes it a much nicer product. It makes it a much nicer experience, but it's fundamentally great business. And it's no coincidence that Lush has done very well over the years off that kind of great business. So your That's product then, in this case, your product, if I understand it correctly, it doesn't just help companies measure their carbon emissions in because the way, if we're to say that to an organization, okay, um, many will say, unless obviously they, they I mean, fair enough, your um, kind of clients, your type of clients, the, tar the ones you, ta you target would understand that. But if we're talking about people who are looking to join you, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you are hiring and you're looking to, for people to join you, they will need to understand the value you bring to a client, to a company, other than what the client does believe to be essential. So you're not just measuring that, you're telling me that you also look at the numbers, how you could save them money by pushing them towards the efficiency side. Is that, am I, am I understanding that correctly? Is that what your product you, does? You are, you are, and most of it, it goes back to what we were saying earlier in our conversation, right? Which is that the best way for us to achieve radical change in the world is there is for there to be real incentive behind it for the people who need to make that change. And that means that unless this transition to a more sustainable world not only pays for itself, but even generates upside, cash upside for the people behind it, until that happens, it's not going to be real. And if you look at Tesla as a great example, right? I mean, Tesla has made a fantastic business model out of facilitating the change of others. If you look at the financial numbers for Tesla, right, you're looking at a net income number of six or seven hundred million dollars uh, last year, I think. And if you look at the amount that they made from the sale of regulatory offsets, that number is something like one point six billion. Right. I might be off by a couple of hundred here, here or there, hundred million here or there. But like ultimately, those offsets that Tesla generated have been sold to other businesses that needed that token more than Tesla did. Um, and if you look at that potential for Tesla, not only to fuel its own growth as a business that is catalyzing change in the world, but also empower and fuel the growth of others. This is business, right? This is the commercial incentive creation happening, not just for one country, one company, but for many others. And until we can tap into that, and, and so yes, you know, you're right. When you, when you say that we are not only helping companies become more environmentally sustainable, 
but also helping them make money by doing that, we're, we're, the answer is 100% yes. And the reason is for us as a company, that's what makes our mission successful. We are not the guys going out there on a, you know, a, a kamikaze suicide mission to try and save the planet and, and, and lose a lot of money doing it, right? We are the guys trying to build a, a wildly successful tech business by going out and helping companies to become even more successful and even more profitable by actually doing good for the planet. And while that may not sound like undiluted goodness, the true fact is that that's effective goodness, right? That's what actually gets change happening. And I wish that people would do it for its own sake. I wish that people would do it because it's the right thing to do. But I'm pragmatic enough to want it done, basically, right? Even if they mm. have other incentives. Okay. Look, th this is a new space. Okay, this is a new space at the moment, and it's not really well regulated. I mean, if we even if even if we were to look at the sustainability figures, uh, carbon em emission figures, many companies, corporate uh, organizations are trying to implement KPIs uh, around those. I mean, there isn't even some sort of a standard or a regular uh, KPI for figures. So companies are still getting used to this whole thing. Everybody's still trying to find their feet. So this is a big space, uh, a new space, and a big one. Um, why should organizations choose you over any other potential competitor that 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 uh, there could be out there? Um, we're not going to mention names, but I, 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 I'm aware, for example, of a German organization. It might do it might do a similar job. But what makes you guys different? Why are you different? You know, I think that, I, you know, whatever I've seen of effective and successful SaaS businesses suggests that they are not necessarily the first ones to have a good idea. And often the more different their idea is, the less successful they're likely to be. Because with B2B, you know, with enterprise software, companies aren't going to go on for something that is a crazy, out on a limb, random, but intellectually interesting idea. They want something that is actually gathering traction and interest and momentum in the market. And so for us, I think it is an incredibly positive thing that there are other companies that, that are doing this. And frankly, other companies that have started doing this, you know, several months or a year or a year and a half or whatever before us, right? I think it's great. For us, it's fantastic. Validates our idea, you know, lit the way for us in many ways, gave us comfort and conviction and confidence to do what we're doing, uh, gave our investors comfort and confidence, right? It, it's amazing. And so I, I'm, I'm fundamentally, I'm appreciative of these guys and I'm appreciative of them, not because of what they've done for me, but also because they're doing good work, right? I wish there were more of them. I wish them every success. I'm a big fan of theirs in, in, in almost every way, right? Like, uh, you know, all, all success to them. The second thing is there's room enough in this market. We're talking about a transition that means that pretty much every large business, even every medium business and eventually every small business is going to need some version, some shade of the tool that we're discussing. And there will be all kinds of offerings out there. There will be some at a very low price point. Frankly, there are versions of this for the individual consumer, right? Which will be you know, maybe several dollars or, or tens of dollars a month or whatever it is. And there are versions for you know, the small companies and the digital direct to consumers and, and all, all kinds of businesses. And so I think there's just so much room when you talk about a whole new, you know, think about again, the, the CRM, when the marketing and sales function has just begun existence in the world, you would have a wide open market and you can't serve. I, I can't serve this whole market. I can't serve. I can probably not even serve 1% of this market over the next eight years. Okay. So right? th this, like, this is, this is okay. You're embodying the idea, uh, the theory of uh, effective altruism. It is, this is fantastic. Um, you, 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 you are, the company, the ethos you're bringing in, which is great, is very respectful, respectable, sorry. Um, but what's your USB? We still don't know what's the USB. Okay, you don't want to take any chunk away from anybody. There's enough room for everybody to compete. Fantastic. But what's your USB? Why, if I'm gonna, if, if a company's gonna use you, why should they use you when they could go somewhere else? But yes, I'm not trying to take it away from somebody else, but what makes you different? I think at this point, there are 
two answers to that question, right? One is the answer, let's say right now today, and one is the answer we might give in a year. The answer today is we're the ones that have the credibility and the trust to get through the door. So we have had, you know, our business with, you know, coming again, McKinsey, Formula One, our investors are some of the best known uh, people in the UK, right, for the business community. We have had, uh, and, and frankly, even, even wider, right, and some of our advisors are equally well known in the US. We've had no difficulty walking in to discuss, obviously no one walks in anywhere now, but like zooming in yeah. to the discussions with these chief sustainability officers and with CEOs. And frankly, we've now hit the peak where we just can't do any more of those from a capacity standpoint. So the fact that we're able to do that is a signal of trust and credibility that frankly, for a business at our stage is a huge boost helping us get through the door. That is, I think, the immediate uh, kind of immediate factor, right? Like that's just why we are having all these conversations and not maybe a company that's six months uh, older. I think there's another aspect which is more likely to lead to our USP a year from now, which is we really understand the needs of big business. And, you know, like a lot of this ends up coming from, you know, just as the person who founded the company, a lot of this is going, you know, at the start, all you have is your own experience, right? That's all you can leverage. And my experience is years and years of working with large, you know, huge businesses with all kinds of complexity, all kinds of integration needs across different functions. It's messy. It's not the same as consumer, uh, consumer software, the requirements there. And the sustainability function is in many ways quite special and different, even within that, right? Like a lot of SaaS, you would need to engage with the, uh, the IT structures of the business really to, to enter in. Here, you know, the decision makers are those chief sustainability officers and their sustainability functions. And these are the people that I've been speaking to on a daily basis for years now. And so the ability to actually speak their language, relate to their problems, understand what is top of mind, what isn't quite top of mind yet, but what might be in three years, this is a nuance and a, you know, almost like a gut, right, expression that you only really get just through doing it day in, day in, day in, right? Like day out. And, and I, I, I've just been doing that now for so long that at McKinsey, it almost became boring, right? But here it's a massive advantage and a massive benefit. And the investors that we've sought out are the same, right? These are chairmen of banks, CEOs of private equity funds, uh, right? Top tier consultants, as well as, you know, tech founders like Greg and, and Jonathan Patrick and others. But we can just really relate to big business in a way that I think, and again, I, I mean no disrespect or discredit to our competitors, but they come from a consumer landscape. In most cases, they've been in the consumer technology space, selling products to individuals. And that's an amazing learning experience for all kinds of reasons, right? It's, it's fantastic. At the same time, it is very different. It's a different landscape. It's a different set of challenges. And it doesn't always bring either immediate credibility with our uh, target market, uh, but also it often doesn't bring that kind of depth of understanding of the real challenges that these businesses face. And so the complexity requirement of our customers is, is much larger, which is why we target larger customers, because there's more potential then for our product to have value, generate value, and ultimately command value when we look to charging for it. It's, it's, it's the people. The, the, you guys, it's this Justice League. People are at the moment buying into the Justice League. Um, and then obviously in a year's time, the results will come in and they will paved the way for those who don't necessarily know the Justice League, uh, at least they will see some testimonials there. It, it kind of is, right? If you want someone to fly, you need a Superman. If you want someone to run, right, you need a Flash. But like you kind of have to have the right tool for the right set of problems. And we feel we're the right tool, the right Justice League for this particular set of problems and this particular side of the market. Okay. Um, look, Silicon Roundabout, we, us as a community, uh, we deal with startups on a daily basis. We have dealt with many, 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 many startups. We've witnessed startups, uh, you know, rise, fall, never make it. Uh, some make it huge, such as Monzo, for example. Um, but each to each their own challenges they've gone through. So far from what I understand from you, I mean, you, you quit your job back in December. Correct. You started this yeah. in January. Uh, yeah. You've already 
you've you've overhit your investment target that you've stopped taking people's investments and you're like we cannot take that's it you're rejecting investors now because you cannot take any more than that and you've already in a way hit capacity from a client perspective as well it sounds like a smooth journey here but i know there are always challenges having witnessed startups been involved still being involved with startups i know there are challenges what are the challenges you guys are going through or have gone through? Yeah, it's a really good question, right? Um, I think they're like two, but they're kind of blended. Um, and the challenge is how do you manage the scale up opportunity that comes with this situation, which is if we go out and try and serve every customer, forget every customer that we could serve. If we try and serve every customer that we want to serve, from a strategic value, all these kind of ways, right? If we try and serve all of them, we will be swamped as a team. We will need to hire not, you know, the three or four people that we're bringing onto the team, but we'll need to bring on 10, right? People onto the team um, in, the, in the next couple of months. And that risks a lot, right? Like if we, bring, if, we, if we bring on business without expanding the team, we risk, you know, underserving, under delivering on all our customers. If we do ramp up the team that fast, you, you, you don't allow all the growing pains and all the growing experience that happens when you grow a, in a little more of a measured way, right? I mean, for instance, something that Dan and I think about is, you know, how do we set up the right Siri, processes? I couldn't quite hear you. Sorry, it's Siri. Is that Siri? Uh, is that Siri? That's Siri. That's, that's exactly <laughs> it's right. incredible. That, it's, that it's, is, it's, that it's, is my you, Irish Siri. You cannot make this stuff up. You really cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, or you are listening to this, the viewers, so this is obviously the second part, the second podcast, if you like, part B. So the first one, we had to have three takes for it because of Cortana. Prior to that actually happening, we were discussing how Siri interrupts all the time. We made sure this, we, we switched them off and look at it, it happens again. This is uncanny. I swear, I swear. I it's incredible. At least you got to meet her, right? I think we did, we did. True, week. true. But we're not going to go to the Irish accent now. We've already discussed that in, no, in, no, no. at the, the start we, we, of the we, podcast. We Let's focus on what we've you and Dan are doing. But yes, yeah, so I was just saying like the, you know, like we, we've, we've kind of got a cadence of working together, right? We have, you know, like we, we, we speak several times a day, different contexts, check-ins, check-outs. We're trying to set up the processes as we go, defining what our culture is, what are the values that we espouse, what is actionable for us, like what trade-offs would we want everyone in the business to make systematically, how do we think about branding, brand identity, you know, workflow, work management, there's just so many things, you know, tools that we use, the list goes on, right? This is all about building a company. And if we just suddenly triple the size of the team, right, or quadruple the size of the team, you just lose the quality of that process. And you lose the quality. And I was actually, I was, you know, I was interviewing uh, you know, someone yesterday and he and I were having this really fun conversation about this, right? And I was kind of, we were kind of talking about how decision-making in a one-to-one -one format is relatively straightforward, I think, and aligning on a decision and understanding why the decision was made. And then when you get to like two or three levels removed or two or three people removed, you're just putting so much strain on the quality of that relationship and the quality of that understanding that's developing between the people in different parts of this team, that's what I'm really scared about, right? I'm scared that we get the balance wrong of either scaling up the, the people side too fast and messing something up mm. or not scaling up the people side fast enough and losing some of the, the great business that's on the table right now. And what solutions have you guys have thought of? To tackle this problem this is actually a, a quite a unique problem um well, sorry not sorry a very common problem unique it's a quite a common problem um for 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 startups especially when the founders they've come together they decided to do it there's always that synergy just like you're having right now and there is always that fear of how things can potentially go out of hand i'm not saying they do but there is the fear that it might do yeah, I think that there are probably a couple of tactical approaches. I think if I think of both demand and supply, right? The demand for work and the supply of work from our side. I think that on the demand side, we have some ability to control that and moderate that a bit. So for instance, you know, a month ago, we were kind of pushing our customers. You know, we were coming back to them, email, let's get a call in the calendar, let's see how you are. 
And we're not doing that anymore. We've stopped doing that, right? So now the pace is being a little more regulated where, you know, if someone emails me and says, hey, I, sorry, Seth, I'm totally underwater right now. I'll get back to you soon, which often happens in, in these kind of companies. Then I'm, I'm just like, okay, look, good. Take your time. You know, let's, let, let's chat when you're ready. And that's a way of kind of moderating the pace. We're still foot in the door. We're still having that conversation. They'll come to us when they're ready, but we're not, we're not artificially speeding it up on our side. In some cases, we can also slow it down actively by saying, look, let's take a few weeks to think about scope. Let's take a week or so to talk about commercials. Let's start thinking about data sharing, then onboarding. There's a process you can extend so that, you know, we're targeting two or three customers for our MVP uh, process. And we can maybe stagger a couple more so they start, you know, right after the MVP or soon after uh, or whatever. So there's a bit of that ability to control demand. On the supply side, we already have a scale up plan. We can, of course, accelerate that a bit, but I think what's important is that we, we, can, we moderate that and also that we make sure that we're adding, let's say, uh, senior capacity or bandwidth in some kind of ratio to how we're adding on, let's say, more, more junior members or, or, or less, uh, you know, uh, more junior members of the team, right, for want of a, a better term. Um, and that means that we can at least still start to create some of those structures uh, that you might have have otherwise uh, in a more established sort of company because the challenge for us becomes kind of how do you become from a startup to an established company at warp speed right which is which is interesting but in this sort of business where it's again you know it's 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 b2b SaaS, it's not as crazy a, a target as it might be in a consumer business where, where growth is frankly much more volatile i think okay the next point i'd want to you know before we start to, to, to begin to, 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 to wrap things up is, and, you know, we're not going to say too much here because we do have an, you know, an event coming up in the future where we will uh, put you with a team of developers, you know, you get to speak with them as you're hiring. So that's the point, hiring. You are currently hiring. What are you, who are you looking for? What positions are you looking to fill? And how many? So right now, we're the most pressing need for us is a good full stack developer, um, primarily targeting someone with very good front end. Um, and uh, the second role that we're looking for is a, you know, a, an amazing UX UI person, ideally someone who can, you know, combine, combine the two. Um, and then, and then a tester as well. And, uh, and, and someone remarked to me again in an interview that this is a, a bit of an odd combination to look for in such an early stage startup. And I think it kind of just, again, reflects the nature of our customers and the, the business that we're in, which is, you know, it is great to have something scrappy and rough around the edges to share with the more junior customer counterparts. But what we're expecting is that very quickly, this is going to get escalated up for prime time to the CEO and the board and the investors, because it's such a hot topic. Plus, and given so the nature just, of your, not the nature, sorry, but the, 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 yeah, the nature of your clients, who they are. Exactly. You can't right. exactly, exactly give them a bootstrap sort of solution. Exactly, right? Exactly. I was speaking with a business yesterday and it's the CEO and it's a three billion pound revenue business. The CEO wow. is the one who's talking to us and he's then referring us to the number two person on this topic, you know, who then who then takes it forward. So like it will have to go back to the CEO in that case, right? Like we have to, the, the CEO is the one who's engaging with us, bringing us on, responding to the emails, uh, you know, frankly, the fastest. And um, And so we just have to think about things like the interface, you know, making it look reasonably slick. It doesn't have to look amazing, right? But just parts of it that will get, you know, visibility, which is in the long run, good, good for everyone. Um, and then also it's almost better for us to slow things down than to have glitches or errors because very quickly that destroys credibility. So, you know, the importance of having a tester, for instance, in this sort of thing is, 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 is quite high, I think for us. Um, over the, you know, th those three, I would say are the roles that we need now, like, you know, if we got amazing people next week, we would probably ask for them all to join us, um, immediately. <laughs> and, uh, immediately, and then, immediate then, starts. Then, pretty, pretty much, right? Like I think for, yeah, uh, immediately or within a week or, or, or something like that, right? I mean, we, we could certainly use a full stack developer right now and we are using uh, freelance UX UI people right now. Uh, anyway, and, okay. and we've hit the capacity that they had available for us. So, you know, we, we need people. Um, 
And then over the course of, let's say, the next you know, five, six months, we're also looking to bring on uh, someone to help us with the people side because, you know, again, we're, we're doing so much recruiting, but we also want to think about what kind of benefits do people get? How do we make sure everyone is happy, successful, fulfilled? You know, there's a lot of admin work as well, right? A lot of general running, and we want to free everyone up to focus on, on, on everything they're doing. So someone to tackle that side, like an admin ops type of thing. Uh, we are looking at a great CTO. We have someone in mind who we think would be amazing uh, to have. And in our sort of business, you don't technically need a CTO until probably Q1 next year even, or maybe even a bit later. Uh, for us, we think it might be helpful, and we're still thinking through this, we think it might be helpful to have someone so that they can communicate at a peer level with the chief digital officer of a large, you know, 5 billion revenue corporation, right? Or, or the CIO of that level and just remove any risks, any questions on the credibility of our very early business, because it is a leap of faith, even with all I've said, it is a of leap course. of faith for a, a massive company to trust a small startup, right, with sensitive data. Um, then uh, we will need someone on the kind of the, the customer side, and I'm thinking more like an account oriented role, like, you know, engaging with the users on a daily basis, looking at utilization, calling them up, asking how they they found things you know that's uh you know, th that's for instance the bread and butter of the type of stuff i was doing seven years ago eight years ago as an analyst at mckinsey you know engaging with these analysts on the customer side or the client side and just getting to know what what's important uh we will need to have someone uh, at a slightly more senior level on partnerships because for us we're thinking of you know different sales channels or go to market routes uh, different sources of data, different collaborations with different organizations. So that'll be important for us. Um, potentially someone a little more research focused because research is important in this field, um, but that's a bit less of a priority. Um, and I think those are the main ones. Uh, we will probably not be getting anyone on sales because it doesn't look like we need a dedicated salesperson at this, at this point. stage. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think we have enough enough in our pipeline to last us, frankly, till next year um, in terms of in terms of customers. Fair enough. Well, I mean, eight, eight vacancies isn't exactly uh, a small number. Uh, UI UX, a full stack developer, which you need ideally now, uh, a tester, a CTO, a people manager, uh, an accounts person a senior partnerships person and potentially a researcher, but that's more down the line. You guys have heard it. That's a lot of vacancies. I know for a fact, a lot of the people in the community <laughs> who fit the tech side of things will definitely be very, very interested. Um, and I mean, if anything, I'm actually looking forward to the event. Now, when we do it, uh, this will be an exciting one where you are going to talk to a full, full, full range of people, really wide range of people who could potentially fill the, the tech one tech vacancies that you have. Okay, safe. It's been incredible so far. This has been, I must say, and I do admit it, this has to be one of the most enjoyable conversations I have had. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I <laughs> thoroughly this. enjoyed listening to, or about, listening about, talking, hearing about your Justice League. Uh, guys, it is Thursday evening. We have had a very tough week here, so please forgive <laughs> mixing up the words. You know, Mustafa, the, the sad thing is our take one and take two were probably just as enjoyable, right? But no one will hear those, like yeah. the, all the preludes. Ex exactly, exactly. We, <laughs> might, we, we managed to just carry on. Honestly, I really, really enjoyed it. This is incredible. I think we've, we, we've spoken for like six hours this week do you realize that like five or six hours this week we have we have yeah because so what, what obviously what what the listeners don't realize is that we had to have <laughs> several conversations prior to doing the podcast so that i would really understand what the business is about and i can ask the right questions as well um but that's not to say that safe has actually been given any questions before he doesn't have a clue why i was about to ask uh because we just make a habit of that we never share the questions because otherwise we can't get the real answers uh and that's what we want to do uh but honestly what you're doing is very 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 exciting um i can only say that we are very excited as silicon round about me as a person uh the community in general to partner with you guys to work on this together 
this has been fantastic. Uh, also, we have to say that a uh, big, massive thank you for uh, TechTree, our partner who helped introduce us to SAFE, who we are working in collaboration with as well to help ensure SAFE gets all his vacancies filled up. And uh, yeah, stay tuned. We will be going back, uh, coming back to you guys with an event. SAFE, uh, we have to ask you a few questions. Um, they are basically uh, just, you know, random questions, few questions. We, it's, a, it's, it's a silicon roundabout fashion we end every interview with. Uh, we, we can't really give you uh, much time to think. Question number one, if you were to have one special ability, what would it be? Ooh. Um, flying. Flying. Flying is always great. Flying is always great. Okay. It's a boring one, but it's just priceless. Fair enough. If you were to be one cartoon character, who would it be? And that, and you know, if, if you weren't, for example, by any the chance, one I, the one that came into my mind was Johnny Bravo, but that's probably the worst. <laughs> okay, I've never actually heard that one before. I've never heard that one before, and I've been asking these questions for a long time, many years, by the way, many years. Prior to Silicon Roundabout, I've never had somebody answer that. Why? And it's not like the first one that came out to mind. If you were to be one, why would it be Johnny Bravo? You know, Johnny Bravo is always happy. Have you noticed this? Johnny he Bravo is. He was always happy. I, true. He was always happy. He was always happy. Always, happy, always, full, of always full of confidence. Confident. Yeah. The joke is the joke is for everyone else, but the joke is not for Johnny. Like Johnny is Johnny is happy, and what's better than that? True. True. It. Okay. The thing is, this question isn't really. It's it's a bit it's a bit um, weird, strange asking you given what you guys do. But if you were to solve one global crisis, what would it be? I mean, should I pick the obvious one or? <laughs> so... <laughs> other than the obvious one, other than the obvious one, other than your other mission. Than the obvious one. Yeah, other than your I mission. Longevi- I would pick longevity. Longevity. Because. Because I think if we can get rid of global warming, right? Uh, obviously, massive if. But if we could get rid of that, next one on my list would be longevity. In what sense? In what in what sense, basically? Prolonging lifespans. Like I think when you can remove the factors that lead to death, right? That, okay. I mean, again, if if you think. I, but I wouldn't we, think wouldn't it, we just be a bunch of moving skeletons, really? At the age of over a hundred, I mean, our bodies they decay at the end of the day. They they, they yeah, age. So, l- l- Look at look 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 at how healthy, for instance, your you know your 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 elderly relatives might be right now versus what they would have been sixty years ago at the same age, right? We're just we we. It's not just about expanding lifespans; it's about reducing and removing the factors that lead to sickness, ill health, and death. I mean, no one really mm-hmm. dies of old age. You die of of something, an organ failing, uh, or, or something else, and so. If I, you know, the, the, it's almost like the same reason I care. One of the reasons I care about global warming is because, from an altruistic point of view, you want to add on, you know, to the sum total of global happiness. And one of those ways in which to do it is to add on more, more units to to lifespans, add on more opportunities for happiness. And so, if you can do that with global warming, you can do that also with expanding longevity. So, imagine if you were now to find some solution that could add a year of life onto everyone on Earth. How many lives have you saved? What is the equivalent, right? It's the same logic Steve Jobs used for having a, a faster startup on the on the the, the early Max, right? It's it's you're, you're saving seconds of people's lives. It's the same logic here. Fair and enough. Imagine if you could keep extending that. I don't want to say indefinitely, right? But uh, but into the future, and that would be amazing. That would be very cool. And we could imagine what you could do if you get that right, right? Like you could. Oh, the possibilities are endless. If you, you can, the possibilities are absolutely into endless. Space. For sure, right? It would be so cool. Oh, sp- spoken, spoken like an innovator. Spoken like an innovator. <laughs> Last question: If you were to have a conversation, one dinner conversation over dinner or drinks, one person, uh, alive or dead, who would it be and why? Ooh, tough one. That one's actually a tough one. We'll make it easier. Let's go for alive. Alive. Yeah, um, or if you prefer from history, it's up to you. Like, whatever you choose. Sorry, this one's really tough. I'm just gonna think about this for a second. Um, well, it is meant to you throw you what? off. Omar Khayyam. I'm gonna go with Omar Khayyam. Can I ask who that is? I actually, I can't. I can't believe I'm gonna have to ask that question. Sorry. So Omar Khayyam was a um, 
And he's actually Syrian, which is ironic. What? Uh, okay, now I am officially embarrassed. Thank you for embarrassing me in front of the entire community. Okay. <laughs> who's who's um, Omar Khayyam? Omar Khayyam, so who's that? Omar, Omar Khayyam was, was a, a polymath. So he was a mathematician at the royal court, uh, in the court of the caliph. And he was also a poet. So he wrote the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which is a beautiful, you know, set of, of, of poetry. And the poetry was is was is really rich and really vivid, and um, and to be that and to also be a mathematician, I think is a really interesting balance of of two two skill sets, right? That I guess are, are related as well. And so I just imagine the quality of the dinner conversation would just be really really interesting with a lot of depth and richness. And and the time that Omar Khayyam was kind of you know was living in was also a, a time when when Sufism was was quite widespread. And, and Sufism, in, in the sense of its kind of cultural and, and, and literary depth as well, right? Like we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the, the people who had been inspired by Rumi and, and, and Shams and, and, and these guys. You're talking about and, the era uh, of where scientific inventions, you know, exactly, the golden age. Exactly. I mean, lots of people, exactly. which, 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 you know, we're not going to get into history or politics here, but it is the age where a lot of people think it's the dark ages, but the reality is that's where Europe was in the dark ages. The reality is it was actually the golden ages for, for human history, if you like. Exactly. Right. I mean, like, you know what, with, with, with Rumi, for instance, right. I mean, it's just it, it, my second might've been Rumi, right. I mean, Rumi is a bit of a cliche now, but like, you know, the, the whole idea. Him, that, I know him. I know. Okay. I'm glad you chose someone yeah, I know. But you know what the, what what the story is about why Rumi why Rumi started started on his his travels and started kind of spreading you know his, his brand of Sufism was because he was he was a student of Shams Tabrizi and Shams one day leaves the house for like an errand or, or or for some reason and Shams never returns and so Rumi goes out in search of Shams and so like a, a lot of his poetry is actually around this search for Shams Tabrizi. And you know the, the 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 lyricism of it when he's saying I'm uh, you know I'm 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 not a lunatic roaming through the marketplace I am a lover looking for his beloved uh, who who was Shams Tabrizi in in the spiritual sense um, you know I mean like just just someone from that era with steeped in that sort of you know cultural tradition anyway I'm I'm kind of rambling but wow no I like that's incredible I, okay fine I'll, I'll I'll tell you what if we had if we had um... Uh, a prize for uh, or a board, let's just say the most interesting answers we've had. Then so far, yours would definitely be at the top. I, and actually, actually, do you know what? I think we should do that. I think we're. I think I'm going to do that. I will do that. No promises, though, listeners. But I will definitely work on that in the near future. We will definitely have that board. No promises for the immediate future, though. Safe. It's been great. Thank you very much, and I look forward to speak with you again at the event. For sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mr. Take care. And, and bye to all your listeners as well. Thank you.